one. So let's look at how we name ionic compounds. There's actually three categories, if you will, or three types of ionic compounds you'll run into. The first type is the ionic compounds that contain monovalent ions or only one charge ions. And remember, these are your representative elements, groups 1A through 8A, and also zinc and silver. They have only one possible charge. So the way that we name these compounds is you give the full name of the metal, and then for the nonmetal, you name, take the root name of the nonmetal and add the ending IDE. So you change the ending to ide. So like fluorine changes to fluoride, chlorine changes to chloride, iodine changes to iodide. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Here we have sodium. He's in group 1A, so he's monovalent. Lithium is also group 1A. He's monovalent. They only have one possible charge. So you name your first element sodium. And then chlorine changes to chloride, so C-H-L-O-R-I-D-E, sodium chloride, otherwise known as table salt. Here we have lithium, so we name the first element L-I-T-H-I-U-M, and then oxygen changes to oxide, O-X-I-D-E. Notice there's no polyatomic ions here, so you take the second element, root name plus ide, and you do not change the first element's name. All metals' names stay the same. All right, we'll do the examples um, in class, um, but you can try these on your own and then we'll check them in class using the same pattern, full name of the metal, and then root name plus ide for the second element. Now the second type of ionic compound that you'll run into is the ionic compound that contains a multivalent cation. So remember those are the Transition metals and then tin and lead, they were also multivalent. They have multiple charges. So in order to name these, we've got to use what we call the stock system. And all that means is you're going to be using Roman numerals that represent the charge on that multivalent ion. So like if you have, remember we talked about iron can have a plus two or it can also have a plus three charge. So Okay, sorry for that interruption. All right, so this one would be called iron Roman numeral two, and this would be called iron Roman numeral three. So that's really the only difference. If the ion has only one possible charge, like the type one that we just looked at on the previous slide, it's monovalent, you don't need a Roman numeral. So zinc and silver will never need a Roman numeral because there's only one possible charge. It's kind of like in a classroom, if you have two students with the same first name but a different last name, um, I would have to, when I call them up to get their work, I would have to say, for example, um, their first name, Taylor, and then, for example, if I had two Taylors, Taylor Leonard or Taylor Jackson. So anyway, you have to give the Roman numeral. So let's practice a couple of these. So remember, you name your first element the same. So this is iron. But since iron is multivalent, we're going to have to give a Roman numeral. This Roman numeral is going to indicate its charge. So I'll come back to that in just a second. Let's go ahead and name the second element. So it's iodine, so it changes to iodide. I-O-D-I-D-E. So now we've got to uncrisscross this formula to figure out what the charge is on iron. So remember, when we wrote our formulas, we had to label our charges and crisscross them. So like iodine's charge crossed down here to iron. So you can see Iodine, we know, always crosses a negative one down, so there's his one. So what that means is this three is what iron crossed down. He would have crossed a plus three. So this would be iron, Roman numeral three, iodide. So iron three, iodide would be the name of this compound. Here with nickel and phosphorus, so we're going to name nickel, N-I-C-K-E-L. And since nickel is multivalent, we're going to have to give a Roman numeral to tell me the charge that he used in this formula. So we're going to uncrisscross it. Now remember, phosphorus is always a negative 3, and that's exactly what we see here. So that means nickel crosses 2 down. So he would have been a positive 2. So we'll say nickel 2 phosphide. 
And then here with copper, copper is also multivalent, so we'll still name them copper. And then we're going to name fluoride. But we've got to figure out what copper crossed here. So let's uncross cross our formula. Since fluorine, we know, always crosses a negative one down. That's what we see. Copper must have also crossed a one down, which would be a positive one because he's a metal. So it's be copper one fluoride. You want to be careful with these for reduced formulas, though, because if they're reduced, um, you'll have to uh, give me the charge that it crossed before it got reduced. We'll practice these um, in class. Now, if you have a polyatomic ion, you just got to memorize the polyatomic ion. So just like you learned the name, um, you name it that. So remember, most of your polyatomics are going to end in eight or eight. So for this one, sodium. And this is phosphate. So you just got to memorize that's phosphate. There was phosphate and phosphite. This one is phosphate. Here's calcium. And then this is nitrate. Now, why do I not need a Roman numeral on these particular names? Well, look back at your metal. These are monovalent. Sodium's in group 1A, so he's always going to be a plus 1. There's no reason to give a Roman numeral. Calcium's in group 2A, he's always going to be a plus 2. So there's no reason to give a Roman numeral if it's monovalent. All right, so we'll practice these in class tomorrow as well. Okay, that's the lesson for today on the naming the three types of ionic compounds.